Hello, and welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show, a podcast to help you unlock tremendous growth for your app. My name is Shaman Rao. I'm the CEO of the boutique growth marketing firm, Rocketship HQ, and host of the podcast, Mobile User Acquisition Show. In each episode, we feature experts in the field of mobile growth and discuss strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile growth marketing. By the end of each episode, you will have gained actionable and tactical insights that will help you make more informed decisions in your own work around growth. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is produced by Meryl Vincent, Content Marketing Manager at Rocketship HQ. Our guest today is Matei Lancherich. Matei is a returning guest on the Mobile UA Show. Matei is a consultant on mobile growth and he's worked with a number of games to help them grow and scale both pre and post ATT. He's brought a very unique perspective on growing games, especially in the soft launch stages, but certainly post launch and in the scaling phases as well. Today, we talk about why it's become important to diversify post ATT, particularly for games. He talks about the factors that have led to this happening, talks about how it's important to think about the idiosyncrasies of SCAN. And he talks about incrementality analysis, which have become much, much more meaningful as you start to scale. I'm very excited to welcome back Matei Lancherich to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Matei, welcome back to the show. Hey man, thanks for having me again. This is a third time, I think. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah. And I think the first time, at least, I think was very early on in the podcast life. Certainly, you have been very popular even early on. Nice. But excited to have you back a couple of years after the first time, right? And certainly, I've followed and admired a lot of work you've done. We've done a little bit of work together as well. So, definitely admired yep. everything you've shown and taught to people. Excited to have your inputs and insights about a lot of what's changed in the post identifier world today, right? And we're going to talk about diversifying the user acquisition mix in a post ATT world, uh, which we are in now. So let's start with the basics, right? So why think of diversifying your UA channel mix at all? Yeah, you know, these days, everything is changing so rapidly. So last year, I sometimes felt like I'm on the roller coaster. <laughs> so, so there was these times when Facebook was up and then like the quality decreased and everything was changing. So if you put all X in, in one UA basket, you are playing a very dangerous game, I would say. So, you know, uh, what if there is a one channel that you are actually running the UA on and the only channel, what, what if that stops working? So uh, I started to see this kind of behavior when I was soft launching games last year, and I was using always Facebook as my go-to channel, usually very early on during the soft launching. And then I saw a very big decline in terms of quality of players. So I started adding like Google and, and Unity campaigns early on. And the thing was, I was able to get more data points for benchmarking in the, in a soft launch. It was definitely very beneficial for making decisions because some games was, were already like on the verge of killing. And then we suddenly started running unity campaigns and the numbers definitely looked better than what we saw on Facebook. So that got me uh, thinking, so, okay, so I guess I can't rely only on Facebook anymore. And I definitely need to start running more UA channels. You know, here's the situation from last year, for example. So one week, you know, there was the Google ads campaigns performing super well, all the TROS campaigns, um, you know, really good. But then other, other week was unity. This was just scaling amazing because we found a new creative winner. And then Facebook triple A campaigns were down, but on the other hand, interests and lookalikes suddenly worked. So it's like, oh, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely, you know, we need to be on top of our game always. So what I'm hearing you say is just because Facebook has been so up and down, and that's certainly been our experience. I think obviously we're talking primarily iOS here, right? Because Facebook's been so up and down, it's not been reliable enough. And like you said, it made the difference between killing a game and keeping yeah. it, which 
you know, the stakes can be very, very high. <laughs> exactly. Uh, right there. <laughs> exactly. Right? And for a live game, so let's assume a game's out of soft launch, a game is live. What level of scale should marketers start thinking about diversifying? If we would have this, this discussion like three years ago, I would say Facebook only channel up until I hit like 1 million a month spent, but it already changed quite rapidly. So I started thinking about diversifying the, the UA portfolio after hitting like 20K a month. Don't get me wrong. The Facebook is still my go-to channel, even though the quality decreased heavily over the last few months. But I just don't want to rely on one channel. And if I'm running a small campaigns here and there, yeah, up until 20K, it still can be just one channel because, well, you need to spend wisely uh, that like small budget. And if you spread that 20K into like five channels, then you will get yeah. a very, very small amount of data and like not at all any significance. So 20K, you start looking at additional channel number one. What happens, let's say, as you scale from 20K to 50, 100 and so on? When do you introduce additional channels from there? Yeah, it always like vary from game to game, but based on the CPI and the LTV equation that I'm able to see for that specific game, then I'm starting to add uh, the new channels basically. So 20K, there's a new channel, 50K, a new channel then depends on how the campaign structure looks like, depends mm -hmm. on like what kind of monetization model is in the game. If we are running like 50-50 in-app purchases versus ads, that opens up again, like a very nice amount of new possibilities. So I don't need to like diversify the UA channels, but I diversify the event optimization or the, the optimization strategy. Yeah, let's say that way. Mm -hmm. If there is like IIP heavy game, then... 50k, 80k, and then 100 and above, just starting to add new channels right away. Yeah. And for folks who may not be familiar, can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by diversifying the optimization strategy? For different types of monetization in the game, there are different events that you can optimize for. So for example, if you have like ad monetized game, you can run ad ROAS campaigns, which is basically the same thing as uh, value optimization on Facebook or TROS optimization on Google, but for ads revenue. Simplified version, you can optimize for ad whales. Let's say that way. And then you can also optimize for different ads watched events as well. So, you know, when players see five rewarded videos, or if you set up 10 or 20 or 50 or whatever, but then you can optimize for different engagement events in the game, like level 20 achieved tutorial completion or something down the line. So there's the diversification of the uh, optimization. And then sure. on the other hand, the purchase optimized campaigns and value optimized campaigns again, like comes to mind. So you're saying, look, optimize for different ad events, purchase events. Maybe there's a non-purchase, non-ad event that's worth optimizing for. Oh yeah, definitely. You can see different LTVs on different uh, UA channels. The same thing goes with different optimizations. And the same, again, like the different LTVs, but different, also different retention profiles as well. And you're doing this within Facebook, within each ad network separately? Yeah, it's uh, definitely Facebook and Google. Then Applavin can run the CPE campaign, which is the campaign for event optimization. So you can use different uh, engagement events. You can use address campaigns on Applavin, purchase optimized campaigns on Applavin and Unity as well. So basically, yeah, there's a lot of similarities between the ad networks, but you need to keep in mind that there can be something different again. Because for example, with Unity, if you have MMP, which is singular, you can't run address campaigns because <laughs> they are not connected. <laughs> but if you have AppSlayer, that's easy. You can do that. Right. So there are still a lot of option and possibility for diversification within channels exactly even on yeah. ios yeah right and presumably that's because on facebook you still have some model conversions for the optimization to work yeah unity and so sapla when you have probabilistic for the optimization to work very well and just remind me when you're at like say 20k are you doing different optimization types within facebook how are you thinking about different optimization types at small scale I always try to maximize the spend in one channel. So doing the diversification of the optimization strategy first, and then moving slowly to other channels, step by step. All right. So you would say, you know, if you're starting on Facebook, you'd be like, okay, let's start with purchase optimization, rights optimization, 
ad monetization optimization yeah. once you max it out completely you're like okay let's go to exactly. channel number two and right. you know if you have lots of optimization opportunities that 20k changes to 50k 100k depends depends yeah. on that as well yeah and i imagine that depends on the app's monetization models yeah, but like yeah. you said, look, if it's hybrid IAP plus ads, there are obviously more optimizations possible. Yep. But if it's like social casino and it's like almost everything is IAP, then... Yeah, then it's, you, very, you it's very straightforward. Yeah. yeah, you can't even install optimized, right? So yeah. <laughs> in that exactly. case, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So the other dimension of setting up channels post ATT is scan, right? And within scan, what sort of schemas do you find effective and what sort of schemas do you find not very effective? Yeah. Well, I don't think it's all about what sort of schemas are effective or not effective. You just need to find the one that works the best for you. And, you know, I tried like everything, basically <laughs> everything when this IDFA shenanigans happened from funnel engagement schema to revenue schema, and now working mostly with custom schema where I use like four to five engagement events, depends again on the game and everything, then adding the revenue brackets on top of it. So we measure and send as many signals back to um, Facebook or any other ad network or Google as well. But there is also like, uh, you know, for eight games out of 10, the custom schema and the revenue brackets worked. But, you know, there's the caveat that, you know, we were able to get really big amount of purchase events in the first 24 hours. So that's why I was able to scale the iOS campaigns. And I know here comes the part where the UA loves the product and game team because <laughs> we need to be very close to each other and discuss these opportunities together and, and trying to find out how to get as many events as possible into the first day and like send these events back to the paid UA channels and not destroy the, the economy of the game as well. It's all about these little tricks and hacks and then uh, yeah. discussions with the teams. And again, for folks who may not be very familiar, can you define what you mean by custom schema? Sure. So the custom schema is a combination of multiple schemas, actually. So you can use the engagement schema and the revenue schema in one schema together. So that's why I use the funnel version with several events. And then on top of it, there is the revenue schema with the revenue brackets. Which means... First couple of bits, let's just say four or five bits are the early stages of the funnel, register, mm -hmm. complete tutorial, level one, level exactly. five. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And subsequently, after bit six or seven, you just have purchases. Exactly, yeah. Right? And based on the level of depth of the purchasing power of day one, I choose the brackets because, you know, if there is a possibility for players to buy something within like 1,000 euros or dollars in the first day, then when I set up brackets by $1, then it doesn't make any sense because yeah. there's like a huge gap between that. So that's something that I keep in mind based on the, the maximum amount of money that can be purchased or can be spent in the, the first day I set up the, the revenue brackets. That makes sense. And obviously because the first 24 hours are very, very critical, yeah. like just the way scan works. So presumably all the funnel events you're setting up before purchase all have to be within the first 24 hours. Oh yeah, right? ideally. Yeah, 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 of course. So the other important thing around scan is just the privacy thresholds, right? And I've seen Facebook campaigns where your cost per unique purchaser is like thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars, which doesn't <laughs> make sense, right? Whereas obviously something like Unity or Ansos, because they run probabilistic, it's just a completely different method of measurement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're diversifying, how are you comparing these channels? Since the IDFA happened, like it's really hard to compare one-to-one -one those channels. <clears throat> and that's just, I mean, set truth. So uh, I always try to check what the uh, revenue baseline looks like and then start adding the channels. So I start one channel, then checking the revenue baseline after a week or like trying to get some level of data and then start adding new channels after each other. Bear in mind, like this is definitely like not 100% correct, <laughs> but it gives me some kind of revenue trend. So if I'm running some campaigns on Facebook and then uh, I see a big revenue spike, which is higher than what I'm spending, then the margin is there. So that's always a good indicator of me being on the, on the right track. 
And to your point, if you see on Facebook like $1,000 or $2,000 CPA for purchases, it can happen quite normally. There is around like 30 to 40% of these like UA numbers or UA players going into organics. And how was I able to do this kind of like math? I wasn't able to pull it out of my ass, but I used actually a tool which is called incremental. And then they were able to help me identify this kind of like spillover for me. So I, I was actually like aware of that it's happening. I thought it's like 20% because that's what like the data well, told me, <laughs> let's say that way. I was like checking it and it looked like the 20% might be in the organics. I wasn't sure completely. So they ran some kind of incrementality test for me and then identified that 30 or 40% even uh, goes to organic. And if 40% of your UA is going to organic, then yeah, well, looking at $1,000 CPA, that's kind of sucks, but you know, that's not true. That's not yeah. the true CPA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With scan, obviously, there's the inaccuracy because of privacy threshold. Yeah. With probabilistic, are you seeing signal loss? And how much are you seeing if so? Or are you just seeing just like what you see is what you get? There are differences between games, but what you see is what you get. And I know, again, like this is not 100% correct. And I'm sure that this is never going to be from now on 100% correct. <laughs> It's so big black box. I mean, everything was a big black box even before, but now it's just another one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what can we do? I mean, it's still very viable UA on the iOS. You know, the payers didn't disappear. They're still there. It's just a little bit harder to acquire them, but they just need to be a bit smart about it or like yeah. think about it slightly differently as before. That's it. Yeah. And I know you briefly talked about incrementality analysis. So how effective have you found it? I know you gave an example of how you found the organics that resulted from scan, mm -hmm. right? But again, at what level of scale or what number of channels is incrementality analysis meaningful? Yeah. And I know you gave an example, but are there other yeah, I examples? I have more examples. I yeah. have more examples, don't worry. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Definitely would love to hear all yours then. Yeah, well, you know, like the incrementality is something that is like nice to have. You obviously can work without it. There's no doubt. You can work without it, but it's nice to have all these analysis just to get you more data points so you can make a better decisions. So you can use it even when you have one channel and you're trying to measure how your UA activities affect the organic installs and revenue. And also you can use it when you're running multiple sources and uh, you can identify cannibalization with the incrementality. So for example, let's say you're running a Facebook worldwide campaign and then you decide to run a unity campaign in Slovakia. <laughs> I'm not sure who would run it in Slovakia, but you know, I'm from Slovakia. So let's, let's try, let's try this. So the unity campaign is affecting your Facebook campaign since you started it, because obviously if you run two channels in one country, you want to see more installs and higher revenues, but the incrementality test discovered that the unity campaign is basically destroying the whole Facebook activity you are doing. So it doesn't make any sense to run it. So instead of you seeing more installs, you actually see either the same amount of installs for two channels or even lower because it can cannibalize. So that's one example. On, and there is the other example that is like definitely more positive. So you open up a, a Google campaign, which happened to me in South Korea. And suddenly I was able to see a huge install and revenue increase in organics. And there was nothing else that happened. And obviously I could see that even without running an incrementality test, but incrementality test just uh, said, okay, so you're right. But you know, the question is, do you want to run this campaign or not? Of course you want, because this is definitely having a positive effect on both installs and revenues. So uh, it's always a pretty helpful tool. I sure. know sometimes can be misleading. So, you know, yeah. you still need to be mindful of your own thoughts and experiences and what you see in terms of the data, but it can be helpful. Definitely. Absolutely. And there can definitely be powerful insights, but I, like you said, you need to be careful about yeah. how you're interpreting the data. Yeah. But, yeah for uh, sure. And with an incrementality, there's different techniques. You can build basic spreadsheet based models. You could have, you know, relatively complex data science based models yeah. are there specific techniques which you find more effective than the others 
for me, the most effective was using the tool because sometimes the UA managers now with the diversifying the UA portfolio, there is like definitely more work that you need to put into the UA campaigns. And if there is a tool that can help you build the incrementality tests and you don't need to use any spreadsheets and build it by your own, that's super effective for me. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, plug and play oftentimes can work. Right? And yep. like you also said, you just need to be careful about how you interpret the output. And of course, of course, there's the one thing I need to mention. Not every company has the possibility of buying the tool, so they need to do it on their behalf. So I totally get it. And if you are in the position that you can actually leverage these type of tools or any other tools, that's perfect. Saves yeah. a lot of time. Yeah, certainly, certainly. But uh, I think this has been very instructive as has been every time I've spoken to you yes. and that certainly, like you pointed out, illuminates a very important facet of UA after ATT, which is you can't really rely on just the big channels anymore. You do have to diversify, right? So this is yep. perhaps a good place for us to wrap, but before we do that, could you tell folks how they can find out more about you and everything you do? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn, my website, which is uh, lancaric.me. Or if you are a podcast fans, we started a new podcast, Two and a Half Gamers. You can tune in anytime. You were also an instructor in our workshop series, Mobile yeah. Growth Lab, the last edition. We're still in the planning stages of the next one. I hope Amazing. you'll join us for that one. Yeah. yeah. Would be, I would be glad to do it. So. Excellent. So excellent. And we will send a link to your website and everything you do in the show Amazing. notes. Thank you so much, Mate. Thank you, Shaman, for having me again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. If any of this was helpful or instructive, I would love for you to leave us a review or rating on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast fits. This podcast takes a ton of time, effort, and love to produce. And I deeply value every review and every piece of feedback that you share. 